are starting magnetic fields. These are important because the nation that controls magnetism will control the universe. And I know you're not going to get that reference because even I am too young for that reference. Okay, uh, magnetic fields. We started with electric fields because they're easier to deal with than magnetic fields. Uh, F equals QE as vectors. So for the force points in the same direction as E unless Q is negative, in which case it's opposite. With magnetic fields we have cross products. That's what makes them both e harder to visualize, conceptually a little harder, and the math is harder too. So that's why we did electric fields first. Hopefully now we're all comfortable with the notion of a field. A vector field is a thing that exists throughout space at different points that can exert forces. So we have the magnetic field as a vector field, but we have to deal with cross products. So I start by reviewing cross products, we've talked about them before, and practicing again with cross products. And in this problem, I have two vectors. I have A, which is 3 comma negative 2 comma positive 2, and B, which is equal to minus 4 comma minus 1 comma minus 1. What the problem says is calculate the cross product of vectors A blah and B blah, which technically actually isn't enough information because A cross B and B cross A are not the same as each other. So which one do I want? Let's go with the assumption that I want to do the first one I gave you times the second one I gave you. So this is what we're after. Now at some level, I can just look up the formula and we're done. But I do have this way of remembering the formula, which is if you draw a little matrix thingy like this, where you put x hat, y hat, z hat, then you put in the second row the components of whatever the first vector of the cross product is. So that's 3 comma minus 2 comma plus 2. And in the third row, the components of whatever the second vector is, which is 4 minus 1 minus 1. And now you do this left and right thing. So we start we will start with x hat, and we're going to go down to the right. So negative 2 times negative 1 is plus 2. And then we go down to the left and subtract off what we get. So whoop, and when we go off the edge, we wrap around to the other side. So it's 2 times negative 1. So I'm going to subtract negative 2. So that becomes another plus 2. So this is minus minus 2. So next I do y hat. So I do y hat, I go down to the right, I have 2 times negative 4, that's negative 8. And then I go down to the left, so I subtract off 3 times negative 1, so I subtract negative 3, so that's going to become a plus 3. And then I have z hat, so z hat is 3 times negative 1, so that's a negative 3, and then, so I wrapped around. Did that, and then I go to the left. All right, so two negative two times negative four is plus eight. I want to subtract plus eight, so that becomes minus eight, and so I get four x hat plus uh, what eight minus three, so minus five y hat uh, minus eleven z hat. Right, and that's the answer. So I can write that here: a cross b, four comma minus five comma minus eleven. And notice, this is something I've seen some of you do. You don't write the x hat, y hat, z hat inside the brackets. Right? This is just, it's all notation. So what this means is a vector, and these are unitless vectors. This is a vector whose x component is 4, y component is 5, negative 5, z component is negative 11. That's also what this means. And remember, x hat, what this really is, is x hat is this, 1 comma 0 comma 0. And y hat is 0 comma 1 comma 0. And z hat is 0 comma 0 comma 1. So if I multiply this out, this would become 4 comma 0 comma 0 when I multiply the 4 in there. When I multiply the 5 in here, it becomes 0. What I'm going to do is make that plus because I'm multiplying the negative 5 in comma 0. And I'll multiply the negative 11 in, 0 comma 0 comma minus 11. And now when I add these three for x, I get 4 plus 0 plus 0, 4. 0 plus negative 5 plus 0, negative 5. And 0 plus 0 plus negative 11, negative 11. So that's A cross B. Now there's one more thing I want to do here. We're done. But I also want to try and draw this. Now this is always a challenge because drawing in 3D is difficult on 2D surfaces. So as usual, I'm going to find my x-axis this way and my y-axis this way. You probably just remember Z is out of the board, but there's actually a way, once you've chosen two of the axes, you can figure out the third from the fact that X hat cross Y hat has to equal Z hat. I know we'll use our right hand rule. So you have to get your right hand, orient it so that your fingers point along X, and when you bend them, they now point along Y. So X cross Y, and now your thumb points along Z. So we know Z has to be out of the board. So when you're in your axes, you can choose whichever way you want to draw them. And in fact, in this case, in this case, it's not obvious which the best way to do it, but um, 
always make sure you have what we call a right-handed coordinate system. I'm going to blob that out so it looks like that's really the origin. So that's my axes, and now I need to draw my vector. So I'm going to start with a hat. So a hat is uh, plus 3 in the x direction, minus 2 in the y direction, and plus 2 in the z direction. So it looks something like that, right? And then what I'm going to do, um, I did that wrong. Sorry, I did minus 2 in the z direction though. So it's plus 3 in the x, minus 2, and then plus 2 in the z direction. So if I, if I took a dotted line up here, that's where it is, right? It's sticking out of the board a little bit. And then B is minus 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. It's minus 1 in Y, and then minus 1 in Z. So if I did the little projection thing, it looks like that, because it's minus 1 in Z. So that's X and Y. And now to figure out X cross Y, or sorry, A cross B, A cross B, you do this where you take your right hand, you orient along A, and I have to do it like this, and then you curl your fingers so it orients along B, Right, this is really hard to do. A and B, and you see that it's going to point down. This doesn't give me the magnitude, but it is going to point down something like that in that direction. And looking at it, well, I've got plus x. I don't know if that's obvious, but uh, minus 5 and y. Oh, and is it minus 11 and z? I guess this, yeah, probably both of these are sticking out here. They're both kind of bent down, so it's sticking way into the board. Way easier to see in 3D, of course, where if you have 3D, you have little axes here, and you can kind of rotate it around. See, look, there's A and B, and in fact, A is pointing out in this direction, sticking out in the plus Z and, and B. All right, so now you try to do the right-hand rule. You bring in your right hand, you do the little cross product, you can figure out the direction that A cross B is supposed to be pointing. Right, and now as you rotate this thing around and look at it, you can see that yes, in fact, uh, it does work out when you do the right-hand rule with it. So the lesson of that is, there's some advantage to trying to draw it in 3D to make sure you actually got a sensible answer, but the 3D visualization is really hard. The right hand rule directly won't give you the magnitude, just the direction. That's the first problem. And the second problem. All of space contains a magnetic field in the plus Z direction, and a positively charged particle is initially moving in the plus X direction. So before I go any further, I'm going to set up my axes, x, y, and then z out of the board. So that is a right-handed coordinate system, because x cross y is z. Now I say all of space has a magnetic field in the plus z direction. So I'm going to draw that. It's a bunch of little looking down on the tip of an arrow. So this dot with a circle around it, it's like you have an arrow coming right at you. This is the point, and that's the place where the arrow shaft, or not the shaft, the head widens out. Right, so it's a magnetic field. So every point in space, I've only drawn it at some points, but every point in space has a magnetic field pointing out in the z direction. And now we have a particle, positively charged particle, initially moving in the plus x direction. So we have a charged particle moving that way. How will it move for all time? Well, okay. So we know that the force on this particle is, oh, my pink pen is dying too. That's so sad. Bye bye, pink pen. Um, <clears throat> the force on the particle is equal to QV cross B. So Q is positive, so QV points in the x direction, B points in the z direction, so can I do this? QV cross B, right? V is an x, B is out of the board. I know that the force on this particle is going to be in that direction right now. I could also just say, um, I know that one way of saying this is that V at time t equals zero is equal to V in the, sorry, V in the x hat direction, and B everywhere is equal to B z hat. So if this is the magnitude, that's the magnitude. And if I do Q V cross B, that's the same as Q V x hat cross b z hat, which if I factor all of the scalars out front, that's qvb times x hat cross z hat. Well, x hat cross z hat is also minus y hat, so it's minus qvb y hat. And I get the same thing, the forces in the minus y hat direction. 
So now, how does it move? At this point, you might be tempted to say, okay, this is good now. It's like ballistic motion. It's just the same as gravity. It's pointing down. So we know that it's gonna be a parabola just like we always got in gravity, and you would not be right. And here is why you are not right. Because, okay, the force is in that direction. It's perpendicular to the velocity. What that means is sometime later, the particle is going to be here because it had some velocity that way. Its velocity is now in this direction, and really I have to do this just an instant later. So I've, I've over exaggerated my delta t here, but I'll come back and argue that it's okay. So I really should have done this an instant later with just v a little bit tilted. But v is now in that direction because the force has turned it, but because the force is perpendicular to V, it won't actually change the magnitude of V. Right? And it's not really the force, of course, it's the force divided by M is equal to the acceleration, and that is what is the change in V for each little delta T. So I took a little delta T, I took this V and I added that, but then I pretended this was a small enough time. What is the force now? Well, we could do the same thing, Q, V cross V, and this is gonna be awkward, yeah, I'm just going to have to kind of bend over to do this. Right, QV, uh, and I'm doing it wrong because I need to get it out of the board. Right, QV, this is painful. If I do it over here, it'll be better. QV cross B, right, V is down that way, B is out of the board. F is now this way, right? F is still perpendicular to V. Well, that's interesting. So if F is still perpendicular to V, it means that the magnitude of V still won't change. And in fact, at all times, F is perpendicular to V, so the magnitude of V is never going to change, so it's going to keep moving at the same speed. And we saw last semester something, when you have something moving at a given speed, and that speed is constant, and the force is always perpendicular to the speed, that is what gives rise to uniform circular motion. So this thing's just going to circle around forever in a circle like this, and in fact, we can even figure out the radius of the circle in terms of other properties of the particle. Because remember, the centripetal force needed to keep something in a circle is mv squared over r. And the magnetic force, I'll call it fb, the magnetic force of the particle, or on the particle here, is just qvb, is the magnitude of it, right? I had, it's in the minus y hat direction initially, but it's different at different times. So we know that qvb is equal to mv squared over r, or in this case, the radius has to be equal to mv squared over qvb, and then the, one of the v's cancel, so I have mv over qb is the radius of this circle, where n is the mass of the particle, v is the speed that it's moving, q is its charge, and v is the strength of the magnetic field. This only works if it's a uniform magnetic field, Right, because if the B has to be the same everywhere along here for the force to have the same magnitude everywhere along here. Right, so that works for a uniform magnetic field, but that's the radius that you'll get. So that is the second problem. A confined region of space that is length L in the X and Y directions contains a magnetic field of B, which I'll put up here for reference, of 2.5 times 10 to the minus 4 uh, Tesla in the z hat direction. That's pretty exciting. So I'm going to draw this confined region. So what a confined region of space means is that B is just exists within this region. The region is L on a side. Right, so everywhere in here, have a B pointing out of the board. I guess I should define my axes as X, Y, Z. Good. Um, yes, a charged particle of mass um, 0.0045 kilograms and charge Q equals 0.37 coulombs. So this is not a proton. It's way too massive and way too much charge. There's a little styrofoam ball that you have put charge absolutely all over. Moving with velocity initially, so the initial velocity is V equals 2.5 meters per second in the Y hat direction, enters the center of the low X side of this region of space. Where does it exit? I'm um, sorry, the low Y side. 
So that means here's the center here, so it starts a distance L over 2 away, and as it enters, it's moving with speed V that way. Where does it exit? So, well, I don't know. Well, okay, so let's just think qualitatively what's happening. We know that the force on this particle is going to be QV cross B, so the force on the particle is in that direction. So that means that the path the particle takes is going to be, well, something like that, but maybe it's something like this, and if the circle continued, it'd be big like that. So to figure out where it exits, we also have to figure out how tight this circle is. Well, I just did that in the previous problem. Remember, we got just relying on the results of the previous problem. The radius of the circle is going to be mv over qb, so that's pretty exciting. So now we can figure out what mv over qb is. Let's actually figure that out. So that's 0 0.0045. Uh, kilograms, and V is 2.5 meters per second, meters per second, divided by Q, which is 0.37 coulombs, and divided by B, which is 2.5 times 10 to so the minus 4 Tesla, which remembers is a newton second per coulomb meter, so I want to do the unit thing again. So all the units together on the numerator have a kilogram times a meter times a second to the minus one. And the denominator, I have a newton, which I'm going to write as a kilogram meter second to the minus two, because kilogram meters per second squared is a newton, times seconds, times coulomb to the minus one, times meters to the minus one. All right, so I have seconds to the minus one. So all right, so this seconds to the minus two here, I can move that up to the numerator as seconds squared, and then seconds squared times seconds to the minus one is just seconds, so seconds cancel seconds, we're good. Kilogram cancels kilograms, meters cancels meters. Um, oh, I, I left this charge out, this, this C should have been there, so that C and that C to the minus one go away. We're left with meters to the minus one in the denominator, which is meters, so the units are good, so it is calculator time. What we get is, 121.6 meters or to two sig figs, which is not appropriate here actually because this is just an intermediate calculation. But if I was asking you for the radius, it would be 120 meters. Okay, good. So now we know the radius. So now we can figure out where it comes out. Okay, so we have to compare it to L. Oh, I can write L down. Let's see. So L, we were told, was 100 meters on a side. Right? This is a big tenth of a kilometer region of magnetic field. So somebody's got big loops of wire somewhere. Uh, whatever, this is a thought experiment. We don't have to think about actually building it. Um, so what that tells me though is that the radius of the circle it's gonna make is over 100 meters, okay? So uh, that means that um, the top of the circle is gonna be 120 meters up, which is something like this. Right? That's the top of the circle, and the right side of the circle is gonna be 100, right? This is just 50. You have to take another 50, another 20, so the right side is this. So the whole circle it makes is, um, let's see, so that's, you know, so 60, so the top will be right here, right, because it's the radius. Oh no, that's the radius is 120, ha, ha, ha. Right, that's the top, here's the right, it's gonna get all the way up here, right? And so then the question is, does it exit out here or out here? Well, that's pretty hard, but in this case, um, I can be sure, can't be sure of anything. So I'm gonna have to think about this. Now, see, now this is a geometry problem and that's hard because it came out that maybe it, does it exit out the top? It's gonna to exit out somewhere in the top and the right. And so now we have to think about the geometry to see if we can make it right. So what we have is a circle here. This is radius L over two. Um, 120 meters, we're gonna call that 6 fifths L, right, because six, Six-fifths of 100 is 120. That's great. So that's L over 2. Um, but then the circle it's making is a radius of 6L over 5. So that's 1 half, uh, which means that, um, sorry, but it goes up to here, 6L over 5. Right, that's the circle. Almost certainly it's going to go out the top here. So what we want to think about is when it is, so then this is 6L over 5 minus L over 2, which is 12L over 5 minus 5L, so that's 7L 
over 5. Right, so 7L over 5, which would be 14 tenths plus 5 tenths, uh, sorry, 6L over 5 is this whole thing. I did that wrong. Right, 6L over 5 is this. So that's 6 fifths, which is 12 tenths. That's right, so this is 2 fifths of L. 6L over 5, L over 2. 12 tenths, 5 tenths. No, this really was 7L over 5. I did it right. Um, 7L over 10, that's where I did it wrong. Yes, thank you. Sorry for listening to me doing all my fractions in my head. So 7L over 10 plus L over 2, well, because L over 2 is 5L over 10, 7 plus 5 is 12L over 10, which is the same as 6L over 5, so good. So that's 7 tenths L. And now what I want to figure out is when X is, so if we, if we have a circle here, let's reframe this problem yet again. If I have a circle here, when X is, so if r is equal to 6 fifths, and when x is negative 7 tenths, what is y? Well, you remember the equation for a circle is x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared. So I just know that y squared will be r squared minus x squared. So r squared is 6 squared, 36 over 25, minus x squared is 49 over 100. So now I have to multiply 36 by 4 in my head. It's going to be a disaster. So let's just wait for it. So 30 times 4 is 126 times 4 is 24. So it's 144 uh, minus 49 all over 100 is equal to, so 144. So you subtract 40, uh, it's going to be 95 over 100. All right. So. 95 one hundredths what? That's 95 one hundredths L. So 100, 100 over 100 L is here. So it actually crosses right here. right? So it's going to exit here at 0.95 L above the bottom is where it's going to exit. And you're like, what did he just do? So here's what I did. I started by thinking, how is this puppy moving? Well, I can figure out how this puppy is moving because it's a charged particle and I do QV cross B. Um, and that leads me to figuring out that this thing is moving, and I also do mv squared over r, so that was in the previous problem, that this is the radius of circles that this thing makes. So as long as it's within the magnetic field, it's going to be making a circle like that. Um, Q, right, Q, v, oh no, wait, Q, v, yeah, Q, V, cross B. And the force is initially in that direction, so I know the circle is going to go this way. Great. So I thought, well, now that I know the radius of the circle, I have to think, now it's all geometry, I have to think, given the radius of the circle and the size of this square, I have to figure out where does it exit. And then I ask the question, well, okay, um, I know the x value where it's going to exit, because that's when it's L over 2 to the right of where it left. But now I want to actually think relative to the center of the circle, because I know the equation of a circle. So knowing that it left here, what is the corresponding y? And actually, if I had drawn the circle better, how could that be a better circle? Um, what is the y that corresponds to this x? I just did the geometry of the circle to figure out that 0.95L above the bottom on the right side is where it's going to exit. So a lot of that wasn't physics. A lot of that was just geometry and thinking through uh, the math, how you actually set this stuff up. That's how you do it. That was the third problem. Of all of that, if you got completely lost at the end, I recommend thinking it through because being able to think through stuff like this ultimately is probably 10th grade math. I think that's where you would see x squared plus y squared equals r squared. Um, plus actually being able to work with it, to think about things like where does a line intersect a sphere. You can answer all questions like that just knowing this. If you know how to work with it and set it up and think about it carefully, it's not just a formula for where does a square intersect a, a circle that you can just look up and plug in and get the answer. You have to be able to think it through. And so I recommend understanding the reasoning that led to this because really it is. If you understand high school math, you can do this. The physics ended once I figured out the direction of this circle and knew that it was going to enter somewhere in this general region. And then figuring out if it was the right or the top required all this geometry. All right, third problem.
This next one's kind of wacky. A proton. All right, so we have a proton. Its uh, charge is 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. The mass of the proton is, oh dear, I'm going to guess, 1.672 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. And I will check later to see if I actually got that right. I don't know if I have that memorized or not. So moving through a region of space that has an electric field E equal to 470 newtons per coulomb in the z hat direction and a magnetic field B equal to 1.25 times 10 to the minus 2 tesla in what the x hat direction. And the initial speed of the proton, sorry, the initial velocity is 2.5 times 10 to the 4 meters per second in the minus z hat direction. So we'll put a minus z hat. Good. Okay. What is the force on the proton initially? Sketch the path the proton follows. Well, here's what I'm going to do. Um, I know that uh, the proton's acceleration is going to be perpendicular to x. And the proton starts moving in z. So if its acceleration is perpendicular to x and it starts moving in z, it means it's either going to be in the plus or minus y direction initially. All of the motion is going to stay in the yz plane. For that reason, I'm actually going to draw x sticking out of the board so that I can have y and z in the board where all the motion happens. So let's do it like this. Let's do x sticking out of the board. I'll draw my axes over here. And then if I do y to the right, I can do z up. I'm pretty sure that works. Let's check. x cross y. Yeah, x cross y equals z. So that's the direction we're going. So that means my magnetic field is in the, let me make sure it's really the plus x direction. Yes, the magnetic field's in the plus x direction. So here is the magnetic field's direction. The electric field is in the plus z direction. So that's B, and then we also have E. So B is red, I should have labeled it. I'm drawing E in blue everywhere. And then finally, the particle uh, starts moving in the Z direction. In the same direction as, no, but it's negative, so it's going opposite the Z direction. So I'm going to bring my particle in up here. I'll label this as B. I'll bring my particle in up here. It's a charged particle, and so that is its initial velocity. So the first question is, what is the force on the proton initially? So we have force is equal to Q V cross B plus E, right? This is the Lorentz force. So this is the, the slides I meant to do in class, and then I let you go early and didn't do it. This is called the Lorentz force. It is just the sum of the force from the electric field and from the magnetic field. So it's really the same thing we've done before. If there's more than one force on a particle, the net force on the particle is the sum of the individual forces. And the acceleration will be the net force divided by m. So sometimes we call this the Lorentz force, but really it's just the electric force and the magnetic force put together. So that's already written in the form we need. We don't have to do any algebra. So we'll write this out. So it's 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs times V, which is initially minus 2.5 times 10 to the 4 meters per second, Z hat, cross, and then B is 1.25 times 10 to the minus 2, and remember a Tesla is a Newton second per meter coulomb, and it's in the X hat direction, plus we have E, 470, Newtons per coulomb in the z hat direction. So let's just think about what the directions are going to be, and then I'll actually do the numbers in my calculator. We have a minus z hat cross x hat. So this component, so z hat cross x hat would be y hat, but because of the negative sign, this will be in the minus y hat direction, this will be in the plus z hat direction. So the force is not going to be all on one, all along one axis. It's going to have both a y and a z component which is a little frightening, but that's okay. So I'm going to go ahead and put these numbers in my calculator. All right, so first of all, although I don't need it, I was very close. Mass of the proton, I was just off in the fourth sig fig. Haha. <laughs> okay, so having worked these out, what I get, 
So the numbers are going to be tiny, right? Because there's 10 to the minus 19, 4 minus 2, that'll give you 10 to the minus 17, 19 plus 2. Um, then here, this is also 10 to the 2, so that'll be 10 to the minus 17. So the force that we get is 0, comma, minus 5.01, 10 to the minus 17, minus 5.01 times 10 to the minus 17. I'll think about units in a moment. And 7.53 times 10 to the minus 17. Now, units here. Um, for the Z component, which is coming entirely from the E field, we have coulombs times newtons per coulombs, clearly newtons. Here we have meters cancels meters, seconds cancels seconds, coulombs cancels coulombs, hey, also newtons. So there we go. So this is the initial force on this guy. And we can draw that. I will draw it in orange. Notice it has a negative Y component and a positive Z component. So the initial force on this guy is sort of like that way. Yeah, something like that. That's the direction of the initial force. Okay, a little cut there as I spared you some of my senseless blathering. Also, this was supposed to be a 17. I wrote it as 7. Okay, so how does it move as time goes by? So here's the thing to think about. The force is in this direction. It's moving in that direction. So, okay, just initially what that means is it's going to accelerate that way. So there's going to, it's going to turn because there's some force to the left, so it'll turn that way. There's also force opposite V, so it'll turn that way and slow down. Now, we want to think about, okay, so that's great. But you know with these magnetic fields that as it turns, the component of the magnet forces, magnetic force is going to turn with it, whereas the component of the electric force is always going to be in that direction. The F equals QE. E is not changing. It doesn't depend on V at all. So the electric force is always going to be a component that way, always, always. But the component of the magnetic field's direction is going to change. What's more, as the speed changes, the, ma the magnitude of the magnetic field is going to change. So to think about this, what I'm going to do is just remember back from the second problem, you know, that's where if there's a constant magnetic field and it's moving at a constant speed perpendicular like this, um, we had for, for something moving at a constant speed, mv squared over r has to equal QVB, the magnitude of the magnetic force. So from that, you can figure out that R has to equal MV over QB. So in this problem, MQ and B are constants, but V is changing. So as it goes down, and in fact, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to move it to another place, move it more to the center here. Uh, here's our particle. Starts moving in that direction. It has a force in this direction. So it's going to be moving in a circle, right? And we could figure out what the radius is, but um, it's going to move down. But here's what I actually want to think about is how long will it take, if we ignore the magnetic field for a moment, how long will it take for the electric field just to, to stop it? Oh, I don't know. Uh, I mean, you could do that by finding here's the component um, of, four of the electric force, which will be constant. It's 10 to the minus 17 newtons. Its initial velocity is 10 to the 4, but what's the acceleration? Well, we have to divide by the mass of the proton. Oh my goodness, that's really fast, right? 7 to, times 10 to the minus 17th divided by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 27 is going to be something like 10 to the 10. So um, the acceleration is huge. It'll actually slow it down really quickly. But I don't know what to compare that to. So let's just kind of think about it for a little bit. So what's going to happen? It's going to be curving in a circle. But it's slowing down because there's a component of force opposite. And as it goes down, as V goes down, the radius of that circle goes down, right? So this is a circle with a big radius. Here's a circle with a small radius. So the result is going to be this radius gets tighter and tighter and tighter until you, you get the tightest point. And now the uh, magnetic force is going to start pulling it that, back that way. And what's more, um, once, once you get down here, the component of the magnetic force, I mean, once it crosses this bottom, the component of both, this component of the magnetic force in that direction and electric force, they're both contributing to speeding it up. Both together are speeding it up. So it'll speed up more than it slowed down here where it was just the component of the electric force slowing it down. Um, whereas the magnetic force was perpendicular, although as it turned it helped. But, so now you have a lot of speeding up. As it speeds up, the radius is going to increase right, as V goes up. But the magnetic field will eventually turn it. So it's, it's being pulled this way all the time with the electric field. Eventually, the magnetic field will have it turn around the top. 
And now as it's going this way, now it's going to start slowing down again because the electric field has a force that way, slowing it down. So it'll slow, slow, slow in a region. I'll have a small radius and you'd get curly cues like this as time goes by. It's not really easy to figure that out. And I struggled myself to figure that out. And in fact, what I ultimately did, I mean, it makes sense when you look at it and think where the forces are going. But what I ultimately did was did a little computer simulation to see what the path was. And so I'll show you that next. Okay, so we've, what we've got here is a, a little computer visualization of this. Um, I've drawn the magnetic field in orange, and you see there's little short vectors sticking out here. That's the magnetic field sticking out in the z direction as we had it before. Then blue is the electric field, so that's pointing up in the plus y direction. Then over here is the particle. I have a little red particle, and it starts with v in the minus y direction, so this green arrow is v. So as you see the arrow gets shorter, it means it's slowing down. Longer it means it goes faster. So what I'm going to do is have it go go and boom you see it slowed down really fast all right and if you really zoom in on it you can see I don't know how to translate with this program I should learn that it made a little curly cue here but a really little one so as I zoom back out and I let it go again as it keeps going you see it it speeds up slow 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 fast 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 and while it's fast it makes a bigger radius and when it's slow it makes a smaller radius because the magnetic field but then the speed doesn't stay constant because there's also an electric field that's always accelerating it in the vertical direction so in a sense you could say the the electric field makes it accelerate in the vertical direction as it's coming up here the magnetic field takes that and turns that until eventually it turns it back down and then the electric field is now slowing it down instead of speeding it up and it just keeps doing this forever. So it's kind of wacky, but that's what it looked like. And that is the end of the problems for this week.